all of tonight's rescues are true stories. We've sometimes used actors or stuntmen, but everything you see and hear is based on the accounts of the people involved. They've helped us to reconstruct events as they happen. Tonight on 999, a lorry balanced over a 30-foot drop, the long fight to save the critically injured driver trapped inside. The three-year-old boy who dialed 999 when his diabetic mother went into a coma. And the four friends who jumped from their sinking boat onto a rock, but the tide was rising around them. There's not much to show now of an accident that happened here last summer. This brand new stretch of crash barrier is the only evidence of a lorry crash that tested London's rescue services to the limit. So demanding was the incident that more than two million pounds worth of rescue equipment was brought in, involving not just the fire, ambulance and police services, but the helicopter emergency medical service that performed an emergency operation right here by the roadside. A reconstruction shows how all these rescuers scrambled to get here and how they worked together for hours to keep the driver alive and set him free. Usually when you're going on an emergency call, you're thinking, can I deal with this situation? Um, what will I expect? You know the serious jobs are going to come, so it's only a question of time, and you never know what it's going to be. So the anticipation is quite something. Two nine. Whereabouts are Waterworks? Is this lorry overturned? Um, is Ash on the roundabout or underneath? Over. Alan, can you get the foods from the warmer, please? Okay, mate, I'll do that. You got the radios? Yep, they're both on board. First, the Thomas pack. Yeah, that's the radio. Thank you. 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 Half the challenge of the job is not knowing what we're going to find until we get there and often it's something very serious which we have very little time to think about and need to act very quickly. was so extraordinary it surprised even the rescue services. A 17-ton lorry had turned over and impaled itself on a crash barrier, trapping the driver in his cab. To make matters worse, it was balanced precariously on the edge of a 30-foot drop. Is he conscious? I'm not sure. I had to climb over the crash barrier before I could get a view of him. Hello, can you hear me? Everything goes in slow motion while you're trying to think, right, what am I going to do first? How am I going to deal with this one? Just squeeze through. Yeah. Just reaching in. That's it. What's your name, mate? Tell us where you're hurting. Where's the pain? Um, your arm. Uh, try to keep it still. We'll get you out as soon as we can. Can you move your legs? At all. His arm was obviously broken. His breathing was quite bad. There was definitely a risk of spinal injuries there. I'll stay with you all the time, OK? His legs were trapped, so he couldn't tell whether his legs were fractured or not at that time. Um, 
his injuries were very serious, really. You just reach in a bit closer to you. Hello. I'm Dr. Steve from the helicopter. How are we doing? I was quite surprised that he was still alive and I realised at that stage we were going to be there for a long time with a very seriously injured patient. The other problem was actually how anyone was going to get into the lorry. It was so badly entangled there was very little room for anyone to climb in. OK, I'll have to get and see if there's somewhere I can get into the cab then. I'll try and tighten that. Hey, boys. Wait a second, I'll have to touch here. The fire brigade's first job was to take off the passenger door to make some space to let Dr. Charles Deakin get into the cab and start treating Steve, the driver. It's all right, Steve. Look, we're just trying to cut you out. You'll be out soon. I know there's a lot of noise, but it's all to get you out. Just try and bear with it. At the time, you feel so frustrated with all the, the metal and the wreckage wrapped around him sort of um, engulfing him, swallowing him up. And uh, the urge to tear it all away and find some kind of uh, extra super strength to, to rip it all away and get him out. As I climbed down towards Stephen, it became very obvious how lucky he was to be alive. Steve, hello. Steve, how are you doing? Just come to check you over, see how you are. His head was only an inch away from the railings, and if the lorry had skewed slightly further to one side, it would have taken his head off without any doubt. I then had a listen to his chest, and it was then obvious that both his lungs had collapsed. He's got four breath sounds on both sides. I think he's got a pneumothorax uh, on both sides, but he's so badly trapped, you can't really get to him to do very much. It was a real problem, and I'd never been to anything as bad as this. By now, the fire brigade had brought in a huge aerial lifting platform that they could work from. The firemen were still trying to cut open the buckled cab. Their job was made more difficult because it was actually constructed from extra tough, crush-resistant metal for safety reasons. For the majority of smaller accidents or low-speed accidents, it's going to protect the majority of people inside those cabs. But with a severe entrapment of this nature, we end up trying to cut through the reinforcings within those cabs, which is like scaffold poles running through the pillars and doorposts, and that creates a major problem for us. It meant a slow, gruelling task for the fire brigade. We'll try it a little bit. Come on, let's get some gear out, guys. We need some line straight off. Dr. Deakin, Hazel and the medical team were getting more and more concerned about Steve's condition. Despite their efforts, he was getting weaker and weaker. I know it's uncomfortable, but it's helping you breathe. Systolic 100, O2 85, pulse 130. His blood pressure was beginning to drop from possibly internal bleeding. Unless we managed to get him out very quickly, he would end up dying still entrapped in the lorry and I thought really we only had a few minutes to get him out. We need to keep thinking about getting him out quite quickly. We haven't got very much time left. When Charles turned round and said to me in his um, polite inimitable way like all doctors have at accidents I think we ought to be getting him out now. That puts an inference on the rescue scene that we've got to react to immediately. So we had to rethink our strategy and we became desperate for a time. Officer, we've got to attempt to push the whole truck that way. We've got to attempt to push the whole truck that way about one foot. Steve? You could feel the panic building up to the point where you thought, you know, what sort of outcome is this job going to have? The plan they'd quickly come up with was to try to lever the cab off the crash railings using a powerful hydraulic ram. But the engine housing had to be strong enough to take it. If it worked, they could free the driver quickly, but it was a very risky manoeuvre. Plenty of room down here. He's coming free. It actually was working and you could see his legs starting to appear, come into view. And he thought, right, this is the chance to, to actually get him out. What was that? Through the engine housing. I'm not going to attempt this again. OK, Steve. He was very lucky and there'd been no further injuries, but it was a big setback and 
we really didn't see at that stage how we were ever going to get him out. Everyone felt really downhearted about that. It is the depths of despair. And you've got to snap yourself out of it. You've got to shake yourself, bring yourself back to the reality that you can still work and you may still be successful. Cutting. So it was back to their original plan, slowly cutting away the crushed metal around Steve so that they could reach the steering column that was pinning down his legs. This was going to be the trickiest moment of the whole instance because it was so confined. We had to make enough room to place this powerful cutter down there. As the cut's being made, the tool is going to twist. So you've got to anticipate the movement of the tool because your hand's on that tool to operate it. And if he came in contact with metal, he could pinch your fingers off quite easily. And also as a twist, he could come into contact with the casualty. So the placing of that tool is vital. Steve's condition was still worrying Dr. Deakin. One more cut, Doctor, and I'm ready to actually cut the column. Right. right. As I start to touch this, it's going to twist into the metal work. So once it's committed, I'm afraid it's committed. Right, everybody ready for this? Yep, yep, got it. Tightening on it. Brace yourselves. Okay, that's the column three. It's such a great relief. You know you're winning, and you know you're still alive and breathing, so you're in with a chance. But we still had to make more space to un untangle his legs. Len Watson and the rescue team then began what they hoped would be the final effort to free Steve. They were using hydraulic spreading equipment, but they were working dangerously close to Steve's legs. Steve was free after being trapped for nearly two hours, but now they had to move him carefully onto the aerial lifting platform, or ALP. Alan is going to give the orders for everything on the ALP, OK? Everyone got that? Alan, it's for you. Okay. All right, the top. After three. One, two, three. Nice and gently. Listen to Alan. Also clearly coming under now. It was very difficult lifting him out without moving his back too much to avoid aggravating any spinal injury that might have been there. And it took a lot of hands to lift him out very carefully. We then moved him onto the fire brigade lifting platform and all the monitoring and his drips had to go with him. And there were a few minutes then that I was very worried because obviously if something had gone wrong and had deteriorated while he was in mid-air, it would have been impossible to do anything at that stage. Steve was out safely, but his condition was critical. He could die at any moment. Dr. Deakin had to take the risk of carrying out an emergency operation on Steve's collapsed lungs at the roadside. It was something that we needed to treat straight away. Although it's quite a painful procedure to have done and something that we wouldn't normally do on the roadside, it really couldn't wait until we were back at hospital. The operation helped save Steve's life, and despite his serious injuries, he spent only 10 days in hospital after the accident. This is what remains of his lorry. It's three months later, and the first time that Steve has seen the vehicle since he was cut out of the cab. I'm seeing it, it makes me feel, well, grateful, really, just to be alive. Really grateful. Very thought-provoking, isn't it? I think I was in it. I had no idea it was like this at all, to be honest with you. It's not the same vehicle I remember. Unrecognisable. As I went round the bend, I had a feeling of going over slightly, like lifting slightly and moving to my right, and then a blank. I can vaguely remember being asked questions by the emergency services, but actually being stuck inside this. I don't remember anything, fortunately, I think. So lucky to get out of it, thinking how close I was to death. I was that far away from it. 
Well, it's, it's mind-blowing. Technology has given us the equipment and we've gained the expertise to handle a situation of this magnitude. It's something that I can boast that I was at, that was a success, knowing full well that only a few years ago this man would have had no chance of survival. We've been to about 700 road traffic accidents and this is the longest entrapment that we've ever been involved with. Stephen was very lucky to be alive when we got there. He was even luckier to be alive by the time we'd actually got him back to the hospital. And it was one of the nastiest uh, and serious accidents that I've ever seen. We all work together. You can't do it alone. And everyone has to help each other to make a rescue successful. It's definitely one of the best for being successful. Youngsters have an amusing habit of imitating what we adults do, but sometimes that imitating, particularly when they're playing around with the phone, can have serious consequences. Every year there are 22 million 999 calls made in the United Kingdom, but only half of those are real emergencies. The rest are a combination of malicious hoax calls and false calls that are mostly made by youngsters messing around with the phone at home. But every 999 call has to be taken seriously. Our 999 lifesaver this week is Avon Ambulance Control Operator, Margaret Taylor. She describes what happened when she answered a call from three-year-old Bradley Shepherd following the collapse of his diabetic mother. We've used an actress and her son in our reconstruction, but the telephone conversation you'll hear is the actual 999 call that Margaret Taylor answered that day. Bradley came into the room early in the morning, it was about 7 a.m., and tried to wake me, and I, I couldn't wake up. And I, I remember semi-consciously thinking, oh, God, I'm in trouble, because I know my husband wasn't there. He'd gone to work. And it was just panic then. Literally, I was just paralysed from head to foot. I remember thinking of Bradley, really. I thinking he's, he's going to be on his own. What am I going to do? And I remember subconsciously asking for help and that was the last thing I remember. Ambulance service, can I help you? Hello? Hello? Can I help you? Yeah. You want to my lad? <coughs> what? What have you phoned the ambulance for? From the sound of Bradley's voice I, I realised he was a very young child and experience and instinct tells you it's not a hoax. What's the matter with your mummy? She's crying. Why is she crying? Well. As far as Bradley was concerned, I wanted to, to try and um, keep him calm, which he already was, but I didn't want him to be frightened. Is your mummy there? Yeah. Can I speak to your mummy? Yeah. Can you speak to your mummy then? Mm -hmm. Mummy! She's not there while well, she's not coming down. Then I actually heard mum cry out in the background and I knew then that mum did need help. Bradley ran downstairs um, to get his mum some Lucasade, which I also understand is what he calls his mum's medicine and he couldn't take the top off. The paramedics got there and they couldn't get in. Hello. Um, they obviously spoke to Bradley, I think, through the letterbox. And he pulled a chair up and then stood on the chair and opened the door for them. Good boy, when I found out he was only three years old, yeah, I was totally amazed. Because yeah. he, was, he was absolutely brilliant. When I see them now, I get quite emotional. <laughs> but, uh, yes, I think Bradley is a very, very brave little boy. Mummy won't very well. I got some Lucasade. Mum! Now, Mummy couldn't get up. And I was trying to push her feet, but she couldn't get up. The ambulance couldn't come in because I, I forgot to get a chair. Then I helped them in. I think people must teach their children 
um, what to to do in, in emergencies because not only for, for the mother and, and the parents' sake but for the children's sake really as well. Margaret took this call seriously and if it wasn't for her and Bradley then um, well I wouldn't be here now. Bradley's call was traced because most 999 calls are automatically logged but you can't rely on that so please give your name and address clearly. There are about a million people in the United Kingdom who, like Debbie Shepherd, have diabetes. It can start at any age, but it's most common for it to develop over the age of 40. It's a condition where the body can't control the amount of sugar in the blood. Most of the time, the body's reaction to this is mild, but it can be severe enough to cause a coma. Most people who have diabetes are experienced in controlling their condition and preventing their own emergencies, but your help could be vital. The British Diabetic Association has this advice. Our blood sugar levels are controlled by a hormone called insulin. It moves the sugar in the food we eat from the blood to the cells of our body where it's used to produce energy. If your body can't make enough of this hormone, you develop diabetes and have to take insulin by injection. If the blood sugar level of someone who has diabetes suddenly drops, it can cause a condition called hypoglycemia, which can be dangerous. Problems happen most often because of missing a meal, but unexpected activity, too much exercise and alcohol can also upset the blood sugar level. Be aware that the body can start reacting very quickly and sometimes with no warning. Debbie Shepherd had low blood sugar levels and showed all the warning signs of hypoglycemia. At first, they might start trembling, sweating and looking pale. A shortage of glucose can affect the brain and cause confusion, unsteadiness and sometimes irrational behaviour. Remember that these symptoms can be mistaken for drunkenness. Bradley Shepherd did the right thing in trying to give his mum a sweet drink because you need to raise their blood sugar levels as quickly as possible. At the first sign of a problem, they should be given sugar or glucose tablets and then starchy foods like sandwiches and biscuits. Keep giving them food until they recover. This should happen within about 10 minutes. If the blood sugar level falls very low, they could become unconscious. If this happens, smear something sweet like honey or jam between the cheek and gums so the sugar can be absorbed quickly into the blood. Like Bradley, you may need to call an ambulance. It's important to get them to hospital where they can be injected with concentrated glucose. Many people with diabetes keep prepared injections of glucose at home, but never inject someone unless you've been trained. If your child has diabetes, make sure the teachers know how to recognize and treat hypoglycemia. People with diabetes should carry that information with them so the right help can be given. You can get testers or a machine for monitoring your blood sugar levels at home, which will help you avoid emergencies. You can find out more about diabetes in the 999 Lifesaver Guide, and we'll be giving details about how you can get hold of a copy later in the programme. If you want to find out more about how you can help somebody who's gone unconscious for whatever reason, then the next 999 Lifesaver Roadshow is being held at the Leisure Centre in Oystermouth Road, Swansea, on Saturday and Sunday, the 11th and 12th of June. To book your free place, call us now on 0891 447755. That's 0891 447755. There's been a tremendous response to the thousand free courses we've been offering every week and the phone lines have been really busy. So please only call us if you live in the Swansea area. Over the next two weeks on 999, we'll be featuring the work of the Kidney Transplant Unit based here at Southmead Hospital in Bristol. It's one of the country's leading transplant centres, but this year throughout the UK there'll be fewer operations performed than in previous years because there simply aren't enough organ donors. For people waiting for a kidney transplant, life can be pretty grim. When your kidneys stop working, the job of cleansing the blood is taken over by a dialysis machine. If patients don't dialyse, they die. David Kemlin is the transplant organiser at Southmead Hospital. There are 80 organisers like him throughout the UK, all hoping to play a part in saving kidney patients' lives. There are 4,500 people uh, waiting for kidney transplant. Now, many of those are living a reasonable life, many are not. 
in our the area I cover, we have a hundred and sixty eight people waiting for kidney transplants. And I'd love all of them to get a transplant. Last year we did fifty five. The year before we did sixty five, and that's about the best we can do. We just cannot get enough. It's an overwhelming, overriding desire of my life. I hope to get a kidney soon. I pray every single day that I get a kidney soon. Vicky Young's kidneys failed 18 months ago and she's been on the transplant list ever since. A dialysis machine has been installed in her home. Her lifestyle is restricted because she has to spend 20 hours each week dialyzing. To stay alive, Vicky must stick to a special diet and is allowed just two cups of tea a day. But the first thing in actual fact I've got to do is find where exactly I'm going to go today. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It depends, it's temperamental because it's still reasonably new. My normal veins, which as you can see in this arm, are virtually non-existent, simply wouldn't be able to take the needles. So um, I had the small operation done under local anaesthetic. I've sort of got this rivulet of veins going up my arms now in order to take these needles. This is the bit I hate the most, I must confess. They say, oh, you get used to putting the needles in yourself. I promise you, you never get used to putting needles in yourself. That's in. Sometimes it takes a bit of persuading I'm, I'm resentful of the fact that I rely on this machine for my life and my existence. I don't want to be reliant on, on a machine, not when I know that I could be capable of s sustaining my own life. Now I have to test it, make sure it's okay. I've got my flow, there it is. For the majority of people who can't face dialyzing themselves at home, there's only one option, a visit to their local hospital three times a week. It took about four years, I suppose, for, for my kidneys to eventually pack up. And one night I was undressing um, up in the bedroom and my legs were out like tree trunks, sort of thing, all the water. And uh, the doctor sort of whipped me off to a specialist. I was sort of in hospital within a couple of days. Um, I was given a kidney, and after 10 days, I had the stitches out. And four days later, I rejected. It's quarter to six in the evening. I've just received a call from a local hospital in Bristol that there is a potential multi-organ donor. And as the transplant coordinator, it's my job now to go and uh, talk to the relatives and to uh, explain to them and answer any questions they may have. We may be able to uh, retrieve a heart, lung, liver, kidneys for transplanting. I don't know yet. We're on our way to find out exactly what we can do. Only those people who die in intensive care and have been declared brain dead can be considered for organ donation. We have a situation where uh, a gentleman has died. He is on a ventilator on, in this intensive care unit and he is brain stem dead and those are the conditions which mean that he can be an organ donor. We have permission from the family for him to be a donor. I have to get other permissions, but at the moment I'm trying to get as much information as I can to see if oh, um, the organs can be used for transplanting. Okay, bye. I've talked to the relatives, a lovely family, a wonderful family, a lot of them. They're quite, um, I wouldn't say happy, but they're, they're pleased to think that their loved one can help save some people's lives tonight and they're very, very okay about it all really. Very brave, wonderful family. The thing I'm trying to get done as soon as I can is to get enough information to tell our heart and liver team that we have a potential donor and are they interested because they're 140 miles away and they take an hour to mobilise and three to get here and it's now quarter to eight in the evening so, you know, we want to get on. Look, I've got to ring UKT in a second to try and get rid of the heart, so I'll do that bit. If you just get hold of the Royal Free for me yeah. and ask them if they want it. Yeah. And if they don't, you do. So I've got to take her for the liver. Right, if we say it's 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. more realistic time. Yeah. Because by the time we've finished here, yeah. we've just got tied up because we okay. have to go next door because these are all dirty okay. cases. I'll go and grab her. So if we say right. 2 o'clock. Hello, UK. It's Dave Cameron here. Hello, um, I've just had a call from Patworth. No thanks on the heart Thank on this. Said no. 
yeah. Right. Um, I'm not sure whether it's worth pursuing this. We've got our own retrieval centre and Patworth both not interested. Yeah. Um, we're running out of time here. I've got a theatre time at two. Yeah. I just... My judgment is that um, this is not going to be a taker. Sometimes a patient's age or medical condition can mean the organs aren't suitable for transplant. In this case, only the kidneys were removed. Well, the patient's been brought up from the intensive care unit and uh, the operation to remove and retrieve the organs has now taken place. It's taken um, three or four hours to do that. And um, the next stage really is to be looking towards now those who are going to be transplanted. But um, yeah, it's sad. It's a sad part of the process, really. Somebody's died. Yes, life's going to come from that, but um, life from death. But it still still gets you. I still remember talking with and being with the family who were grieving. After the kid is removed, and they are perfused with ice cold solution. They're then packed in sterile plastic bags on melting ice. And the kidney will actually keep in good condition for 36 or 40 hours. Got a couple of patients lined up. It's about quarter to five in the morning now. We hope very much to be transplanting this afternoon. Next week on 999, we see how Dave Kenlin's busy night shift results in a successful kidney transplant. Our 999 camera crew follows the patient and the surgeons as they carry out the four and a half hour operation. This trawler is a relatively new one, about six years old or so, but they go on and on. Some boats have a working life of 30 or 40 years. For four Scotsmen, it was an older boat that represented a fresh chance, the start of a new career. But their hopes were dashed almost as soon as they began. Despite all the best efforts of the emergency services, what determined whether they lived or died was the sheer human will to survive. It was a sunny February day and the start of a great adventure for Ian McIntyre as he set off to take his new boat up the west coast of Scotland to Oban. Bobbing along in the crest of a wave. <laughs> Woke up in the morning, it was a fine day. I thought, well, we'll go for it today, you know. Uh, we'll get up there in about three hours. But we were quite uh, jovial. Oh, be. Also on board that day were Ian's younger brother Alan and his old friends Robert Quigley and Peter Grimalis, all played here by actors. I knew there was an opportunity to do a tourist business in the west coast of Scotland. So the idea was to buy a boat, take up there, do fishing parties and uh, set tourists out for pleasure. But you my boat in, lad. Brilliant, eh? Oh, brilliant. Oh, millionaires! Ian had bought an old fishing boat. He'd given it a coat of paint, serviced the diesel engine, and was planning to fit a radio when they reached their destination. <laughs> Ian had been a fisherman, but his two friends, Robert and Peter, weren't experienced seamen. Alan was the only other man on board who was used to boats. The men were full of enthusiasm as they got underway. The boat was going well, and it was a simple five-hour trip to open. What they didn't know was that it was going to be the longest day of their lives. As the boat emerged into open sea, the first signs of trouble appeared. Pierce! Peter! Peter! This doesn't look good down here. There's water getting any of the oil, it's coagulating. I'll go and get you then, eh? Ian, Pete says to tell you that we're taking in water. It's affecting the gears. You're joking. You better come and have a look. Well, you take over the wheel. Great. Well, I'll let it run for a while longer. You know, and I say just keep an eye on it. We can make it in one gear if we have to. So uh, it came off about half an hour later. He says, by the way, he says, uh, the main engine's now emulsifying. And uh, we're taking in water. The pump's conked out. Uh, like in a panic then. Have you tried the spare pump? Yeah, that's knackered as well. Listen, you can hear the engine still missing. Don't bother! 
of it. What's happening? It's coming in fast. I'm trouble, brother. Right, OK, flares. I'll get the flares. Flares are turning the stern. I'll get the oil. We put up a makeshift sail. So, well, we'll try and get closer into shore. Two hours later, we realised that the boat was definitely going down. There was nothing we could do about it. And by this time, it was getting darker, you know, it's getting dark. They let off all their flares and even lit a fire in an oil drum to try and attract attention. All the time, the boat was sinking beneath their feet. I just leave it. That's enough. I just hope to Christ somebody sees it. The last flare and the fire were both nearly out, and with no dinghy or radio on board, they realised they were in real trouble. Well, we've heard these facts. She's going down. I'm not going to reach us in time. We'll meet you swim through and try and reach one of the islands. Out there? You've got to be bloody joking. It must be about five below. We would never make it. Look, it wouldn't be for long, and they'd soon pick us up. We Come just on, waited until, until the last moment when it was time to leave, you know. You could see that... Just seeing the water coming up, filling the wheelhouse, and thought, well... Time to go. It's going down. Come on, come on. Grab a hold of them. Get them on quick. Come on. No way I'm putting them on. I'm not going anywhere. Just get them on. Get them as many clays on as you can to keep warm until they pick us up. I'm not going. What do you mean you're not going? I'm staying here. That's what I mean. Well, yeah, I'm going. I'm not going. Are you mad? What's wrong with you? Why? I'll tell you why. Because I can't swim. I was quite taken aback with this, you know. Uh, I thought, well, you'll be okay. You've got a, a, a life jacket on, you'll be fine. Come on! The idea was hold hands and jump in the water and we'll go for this rock. We stayed on the boat till the last minute. I think we all had thoughts about going in, you know, whether we'd be safe in it, you know. But we, we, we all said, like, if one of us go, we'll all go, you know. Just as we were leaving, the boat just tipped up. The boat just disappeared, went down, straight down. Went. The Oban lifeboat was actually already out, searching that part of the coast, but for another boat reported missing with two crew aboard. They hadn't a clue there was a second crew in trouble. It was very cold indeed. Uh, we had ice on the decks of the lifeboat, and our crew were very well clothed, as you can imagine, wearing all the best of stuff. They were exceedingly cold. Meanwhile, the four men scrambled onto a rock jutting out of the sea, one of thousands scattered along the west coast of Scotland. It's a very rugged, rocky coastline. Uh, working with a searchlight at night, it's a very hit and miss. You're always hoping, obviously, that you're going to find something, but rarely do you. You really need daylight. And even in daylight, it's, it can be quite tricky because you can't always get as clo close to the shore as you would wish, just because of outlying rocks, etc. I'm going to swim for it. Don't be daft. You'll never make it. We don't know how far it is to land. And anyway, no, our luck, you'll be swept away. I wanted to go down, but I was decided that we'll wait till, you know, daylight, so... We just huddled together, waiting for something happen, you know. What's, what's that noise? Oh, look at the lights. It's a chopper! Help! 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 It seemed all their prayers had been answered, but they were wrong. The helicopter was actually searching for the crew from the other shipwreck. They've never seen us. At least they're looking for us. I'll not be long now. The helicopter flew past us. They built their hopes up again. They thought, well, they're, they're looking for us now. Uh, somebody's come to get us. But in fact, they'd still not been reported missing, and they were about to make a terrifying discovery. Come on, let's huddle together. We've got to keep warm. There's no problem then. You can have a dugging up at the team toast on. Seaweed. Whole top of the rocks covered in it. Oh, hey, oh, a tidal rock. What? What are you talking about? It means that when the tide comes in, it'll cover the rock completely and us on it. We'll drown. You try and get in a shallow place next to a rock uh, with some kind of covering and just kind of shell it as much as you can, you know, and you pray for God. Although the men tried to be optimistic, the fact was that no one knew they were there. 
The chances of being found, even accidentally by the lifeboat, were rapidly diminishing. At midnight, the search for the other men was called off until first light. Oh, okay. oh, come here. Oh. Right, just had After a few hours, uh, the tide was coming up. The water was coming over the top of us. Uh, we realised the rock was tidal. Uh, so we just hoped for the best. Well, we didn't think there was any hope. But you had to have some hope, you know. Uh, the despair was there. Uh, well, we thought our time was up. Uh, we thought, well, this is it, you know. Uh, we could be here forever. At dawn, the lifeboat resumed its search for the crew of the other boat. By coincidence, it was actually heading straight for the rock where Ian, Alan, Peter and Robert were struggling to stay alive. They'd survived. There'd been a low tide that night. The water hadn't drowned them. So I do like Ken. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tremendous feeling. We thought, well, that's the hardest part. The next part's easy, it's just getting rescued, you know. Uh, but it wasn't so easy. The shore. It's only about 100 yards. We could make it. Sit down, it's too dangerous. Sit down. They'll be out looking for us. The lifeboat was now within minutes of finding Ian and the others by accident. But their search was called off yet again. They got a message saying the other men had been found. I'm not coming. I'm going to swim for it. I could have seen the flares. If I make it in a riptide, I'd rather drown than stay and die like this. I don't think we'll get much choice anyway. I realised that if I'd stayed any longer, I probably wouldn't have made it, you know? It did go through my head, like, you know, they, they've all got families, you know, and they've all got children and that. Plus, I'm the youngest, you know, I so expected to do these things, I suppose, you know. The sea temperature was about three degrees. Most people don't survive very long in water that cold. Alan was already suffering from hypothermia after his night on the rock. He not only found it very difficult and painful to swim, but he was becoming dangerously confused as he desperately tried to reach what he thought was the mainland and safety. But he was in for a big disappointment. I got into that island and I realised it was, it was an island, I thought it was a shoreline and I thought I'm going to have to go and do this again. And I, I, well, I couldn't go back the way, so I thought, I thought, well, there's only one way to go, you know, go for it. As Alan entered the sea for the second time, he knew that it might look calm and beautiful, but there was a hidden danger, the current swirling beneath the surface. It was a bit iffy when I got into the middle of this channel, you know, like I thought, well, I could easily get pulled out into the, the main channel. Plus the, the life jacket and that was pushing up against my face, you know, was uh, quite frightening. But at that, that time, when, when you get into the water and that, it's, all systems go, like, swim, you know. Twice, Alan reached what he thought was land, only to discover he was on another island. All in all, he had to swim three channels before he finally staggered ashore. I remember climbing up there, my legs were pretty heavy, you know. But I could have just lay in the mud there, you know. <laughs> could have just collapsed, you know. Yeah, but... I could see the smoke coming from the back of this hill, you know. So I thought, well, there's something there, you know. Somebody's lit a fire, you know. I was just determined to get a shot and get, get there, you know, make sure everybody was OK. You know? Alan had come ashore on the island of Seal, and the smoke he'd spotted came from the local hotel. He'd managed to reach safety, but now was completely exhausted. He had no strength left to explain precisely what had happened. Oh, that's 
Mom! I really got quite a shock because he was shivering violently. I realised that he was obviously been on a ship or a boat or something when he said there's others. But um, at that point I didn't realise what had happened. But, you know, gradually, as he said a few words, you know, we found out that the ship had sunk and um, that the others, they'd been stranded all night out there. So then you thought, well, that must be really serious because um, it was so cold. I mean, it was a dreadfully cold night. Fab, tell me I'm not seeing things. Oak. Miranda Brunner raised the alarm, and within minutes, the lifeboat was launched once again. This time, they knew there were three men clinging to a rock, waiting for help. I just seen a boat coming up the horizon. And I thought, there's a lifeboat. Hey! It was a kind of just pure elation, pure uh, excitement then, you know. But, but I don't know if we went into shock then, but uh, we kind of got up and started jumping about. <laughs> we found them in the rock launched the inflatable and recovered in a fairly straightforward operation from our point of view. The strange thing is that we'd have come across them uh, in the course of our search that morning had the other people not been found. Big concern was the condition of the men. They seemed to have exhibited all the classic signs of hypothermia. Had the distance been too far to swim, or had he failed to swim it, I don't know what would have happened to others, because I don't know if they'd have been missed, in fact. Oh, don't, don't, don't make me laugh. <laughs> My sides. <laughs> oh. All four men have now recovered from their experience, although the memory of their night on the rock has left a lasting impression. I had the feeling that nobody knew we were there, you know. The tide would come in and we just... We just disappeared. We were all felt as if we could have died there, you know. It's quite a uh, spiritual experience, you know. Like, uh, We'll have more real-life rescues at the same time next week. But on Monday, there's a special bank holiday edition of 999 on at 7 o'clock in the evening for the whole family to watch. It'll feature the bravery of young lifesavers, like David Ross, who rescued his sister, who'd been thrown into a freezing river in a cycling accident. And Adam Clark, the son of a fireman, who saved a friend whose clothes caught fire. And there'll be some seasonal advice on how to play safe in the sun.